I am Ganesh Pangare. Mm-hmm. I am the coordinator for the Water and Wetland Program at IUCN, based in Bangkok. Okay, great. And uh, you're here talking about climate change or going to some of the sessions, and also working in in the Himalayas, as we just spoke about. Yeah. Can you tell tell us something about um, what IUCN IUCN is observing in the Himalayas with your work with partners? I mean, yeah. is climate change happening I mean what is happening on the ground there yeah it's a good question see uh, in the sense IUCN works with partners on the ground with local communities and what we are observing is that uh, today there is a big uh, va- variability in rainfall there is also an issue that we see tankers take you know trucks taking water at eight to nine thousand feet up in the Himalayas we are also looking at apple orchards migrating upwards by up to a thousand feet we have also seen issues that the bees are disappearing, you know, which pollinated, the, you know, the flowers for an agriculture. So actually, and there are really strong key um, issues or points that we are seeing in the Himalayas today. Second, I think it's an important point that IUCN is trying to sh- uh, show is that a lot of people are focusing on glacier melt for the Ganges River system. But that's not, that's important. But what people are missing the point is that there are, it's, there are many seasonal rivers which are rain-fed. Mm. And this point, not many people are today lock, you mm. know, looking at, and that's the point I made today also in my session, that, well, it's important to look at glacial melt, but the big river system of Ganges is fed by, it's rain-fed rivers yeah. and streams which feed the Ganges. And the whole change in the water availability and the rainfall is going to lead, make a big impact to what, how much of water is available in the Ganges at the end of the day. Do you know, do you know the per- percentage between the, the, how much is glacial fed and how much is... Yeah, don't catch fed? me, but you, you know, in the Ganges system, it's not, it, they've said about 3 to 4% is all that comes from the glacial melt. Wow. The rest is all rainfall. And this is the point I'm trying to drive home, yeah. that policy makers, people and institutions working, and that's where IUCN is trying to say is, that how do we really work and revive the seasonal rivers and the catchments to really get yeah. more flow into the Ganges? And also look at it this from the perspective of, you know, it's not putting in more concrete, yeah. you know, it's really good. Uh, how do you invest back in natural infrastructure? Yeah. You know, if you have a healthy river, you're going to have healthy people. Yeah. You're going to have healthy, you know, so it's it's also adapting to climate change. You need to look at the natural infrastructure. So, so what are what are your local partners in these areas doing and, and what kind of support do they need from IUCN or alternatively, what is IUCN learning from them? It's again. See, the important thing is that no one institution can work in isolation today. The issue is I won't use the word complex, but the issue is multi, you know, dimensional. Mm-hmm. And therefore, we have also have to have the government actually from day one. So the forest department, government of Uttarakhand, that is the northern state of India, is from day one. It's along with us because you have to also understand there is a clear link between forests and water. Mm-hmm. And therefore, we got the forest department uh, involved with us. Then the other thing is that as I, uh, people forget that local communities are working irrespective of IUCN or the government or anybody. They have, they have to, they get the brunt, yeah. they are surviving on the ground today. Yeah. So that's how we are involved with local communities and one is the group movement called the Chipko movement, you know, Hug the Tree campaign. And we are work, they are up in the Himalayas at 6,000 to 10,000 feet. So we, that's the communities we are working with. You know, there is local knowledge, hmm. you know. We need to see how we can learn from the local knowledge mm-hmm. and how can IUCN bring in experiences from around the world mm-hmm. to work with local communities mm-hmm. in the sense, you know, in the sense, uh, so it's, it's a, then becomes a double-edged sword. We build upon local knowledge yeah. and add all the other, the science or, you know, the good examples from around the world together. Okay. And that's, I think, the need of the art today. It's either people want to, you know, just go in. Mm-hmm. and say, oh, we are the experts, two weeks, and then mm-hmm. get out. Yeah. I think that's really the big problem today. What yeah. we need to do is that some of these issues are also a long haul. Mm. You cannot expect, you know, and that's why I jokingly like to say these days is that everybody says, oh, let's, you know, pluck the low-hanging fruit. But this game is actually, how do you pluck the big coconut? It's a coconut tree, really. Yeah. And we need to re- go there, you know. So yeah. I think that's the interesting part in this. So you do need the low-hanging fruits, but yeah. then don't lose the larger picture, you know. Yeah, you just understand that this is a long process. You have to have community, science yeah. groups, government involved, yeah. all together. And it's what we're trying to achieve here, I think, with uh, this sort of interaction between people. And even at the World Water Week, the potential of, of, of an event like this is that people can share with one another and that yeah. we can talk about you know, how, how we go for the coconut rather than just yeah. uh, the low-hanging fruit. But how do you find... 
um, you know, this is our way of doing it because we think this can go into the field. Yeah. But how do you find uh, in IUCN that you're 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 promoting this? Uh, See, um, we have to first understand is that IUCN's philosophy really in this whole business of water and climate change is that natural infrastructure and resilience actually of the environment to bounce back and resilience of people also to bounce back is what we need to really work on. You know, that's really the long-term goal in the end of yeah. the day. As I said, if you have, if your wetland is protected, it's recharging the groundwater. Mm -hmm. If your wetland is protected, it's helping you to carbon sequestration. Yeah. If your wetland is protected, the f there's fish for the fishermen. So you see, it's, it's then it starts, you know, making sense. It's not yeah. one side of the, you know, or yeah. one piece of the triangle. But what I mean is how, 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 I mean, how, how receptive are people to that message? It's actually by working all together, I think that's the, yeah. and, and I think what's important in this whole game is in climate change and water is also trust. How do we really build trust mm -hmm. between some of the groups that you are talking today? Yeah. How do you get the local communities or the political system to feel that what the scientists are saying is trustworthy? Yeah. You know, and because in this you have to understand that there is a larger dimension to of, of not accepting what people are saying today or a suspicion. You know, this whole thing. So I think that's where I was saying. Though it's, that's not its primary role, it's also trying to build trust, build a dialogue between some of these communities. And I think that's the positive thing. And also the positive thing is that what's come out today in the session is that hardcore modelers and scientists are saying, hey, listen, we have this, but we need to also work with people on the ground. Hey, we also need to work with the politicians. We also need to work with the private sector, maybe. We need to work with, you know, so it's, it's multi-sectoral multi and multi-stakeholder dialogues are also going to be kind of the way forward. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And uh, my pleasure. Enjoy the rest of the week.